today, I really, I just, I made a list of, uh, well, you know what, let's just get into it, because honestly, this first slide really speaks for itself. Um, nothing I'm going to say really means anything. It's really up to everyone to make anything they want out of it. And um, that's what's interesting to me. Three equals infinity, as it relates to me, is kind of the power of, of three. If one is singularity and two is duality, then three is infinity. So within three words, you can really contain everything, um, contain anything, uh, infinite amount of sentiments, amount of communication. So I've, uh, I've written a lot of three word poems, let's say, and um, this lecture is gonna focus on, on a series of these three word poems. Um, there's 33 in total, because that's how many students there are, uh, if you include me and Alana. Um, obviously, that puts the emphasis on the number three. And um, all of these are postcards, like four by six. So if anyone wants one of these, uh, you know, take a screenshot or keep it in mind, and you can give Alana your address and I'll send it to you. Tension of opposites. I think that's often a root uh, of titling things, and certainly is for me. Uh, I heard it somewhere once in an um, interview with a very famous songwriter, and he was talking about how that was um, typically used to, to create titles. He'd written for Bon Jovi. And, Bruce Springsteen and all this kind of stuff. And um, yeah, it's something I always played on. It was interesting to hear him talk about. It's kind of just a general theme here. This is pretty important, I think. Um, I think we're all potential victims of uh, idolization at any given time. And it's quite a dangerous path, although although it's 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 been an intense form of motivation and inspiration for me at times. You know, idolizing certain people, uh, modeling myself, or or pursuing certain things. It's kind of ultimately always led me away from myself towards someone else, and always will leave you ultimately underneath someone else, you know, uh, which really should never be the idea. Well, I guess I didn't clarify either, but yeah, I'm really not going to talk about my own work at all, because uh, in a way it's not that interesting to me, and I guess it speaks for itself and maybe doesn't speak for itself either, but um, yeah, I, I'm more interested in talking about my approach and my kind of idea of, of approach to creative process, being a creative person, pursuing creativity in, in your own life, in your head, and, and uh, in, as a business person, um, as a creative professional. So this is, this is kind of all rooted in, in my own approach and advice towards this kind of stuff. I, advice is too strong, just, uh, they're just ideas. Failure is particularly liberating, in my experience. You know, I'm sure you've experienced uh, how little you can learn from a success, although it feels great. Uh, it doesn't really teach you very much. So in my experience, I've, you know, even doing something like this was really an attempt at um, liberating myself um, you know, not intending to fail this, but opening myself up, always leaving myself open to the potential of failure, however painful that might be. And believe me, this is painful right now. <laughs> but um, I don't know, I guess this is just, uh, this feels important. Um, and yeah, that liberation is really essential as an artist, as any creative person. Um, I think success can be paralyzing. 
and you have a success of some sort and you feel pinned to it, you feel the momentum of that and, and the need to repeat it. And I think also in creativity that is, that is poison. If you have any financial success, uh, you know, it feels great, but now you have that much more pressure on the follow-up to, to have that again. And I really think that, um, yeah, that can just paralyze you. And I've had my own experiences with that. So ultimately, you know, things are inevitable. Uh, accidents are inevitable. And I guess what I'm getting at is this idea of embracing these things, of accepting them, seeking them out in some ways even. Just being interested in them. What can you learn from them? What can you gain from an accident? Problems create technology. Um, I think this is interesting to me in the sense that, you know, a lot of technology is created. I mean, I guess it comes out of like mothers to, uh, or uh, you know, necessity is the mother of all inventions. So I think it's interesting to, rather than seeking technology seeking the end result it's often interesting to to seek the problem to d find problems and and pursue them in an effort of of discovering something on the other side you know this still kind of a lot of this still speaks to this idea like the tension of the opposite and just looking the other way uh looking the opposite way and if everyone's looking for problems then maybe you should look for the technology you know this got brought up in the in the, uh, the presentation i kind of just like this because it spells rat and 2020 is the year of the rat the rat's probably my favorite animal a very intelligent creature subtle unseen resilient it's speaking to the same idea too you know taking risks pursuing possibility of failure uh, leads you to a place of, you know, sharpening your own abilities. This is kind of more, I guess I'm starting more with these concepts of, of paralysis as it relates to creativity. And really what makes you unique, what makes you valuable as a creative person uh, as a person pursuing creativity or really any ideas. And yeah, I know you guys are all architecture students and obviously I have no, I really don't have much to say about architecture specifically or anything I, I feel I could really add specifically to your education. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think the pursuit, and it's almost just human experience. It's in so many ways, it's, it's so similar for all of us. Um, when we compare ourselves to other people, we really destroy everything that kind of uh, separates us from anyone else that makes us unique or interesting. And I think when you're attempting to be creative, I, I think that's a pretty harmful thing to do. I think a lot of your creative potential comes from not your identity as much as your character and yeah, you know, I use personality in this case, but um, yeah, your character, the way you think versus someone else, which ultimately is what makes collaboration and collaborative processes um, powerful is, um, you know, it's two different minds, two different schools of thought, two different kind of places coming together to form, you know, more than the sum of their parts. I, um, I don't know if any of you know who Rick Rubin is. He's like a very famous music producer. Doesn't, he started Def Jam in the 80s out of his dorm room in uh, NYU and managed the Beastie Boys and Run DMC and all this stuff and went on to produce albums for everyone from like Kanye, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Metallica, Johnny Cash, like all these different people. He's a very interesting figure if, if anyone's curious. I remember learning that he removed all the mirrors from his uh, his home, and I thought that was incredible. It might not 
it be obvious. Uh, I'm also not trying to say that I'm this hideous, but in general, avoiding the mirror is a good tactic, at least for me. My perception of self, my confidence, my uh, ability to, to really operate at my highest level uh, comes from highest level. Let's pull that back. Just, just, to, just to be comfortable, you know. It's better if I'm not self-conscious. I think that's true of anyone. And the mirror, generally, not only is it lying to you because it can never tell the whole truth, uh, just like a photograph, and it doesn't represent how other people experience you. Um, yeah, it's really just there to deceive you in, in more ways than it's there to assist you. From this same perspective of of the mirror and all this, you know, it's really your 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 perception, your your thoughts have really the power to to change your life, to affect your life, to to direct it. And I think that's really important to remember, has been for me. Um, negative thoughts are, are really never going to breed anything positive and vice versa. So it's just really about the power of, of, of your perception, uh, perception of self, perception of uh, everything outside you, your environment, other people, you know, the power of your, of your thoughts. Uh, they just they just hold a lot they they hold a lot over you and over your relationship to the world so it's pretty simple a lot of these things are self-evident but maybe i just need to remind myself of the most simple things uh constantly in order to uh to survive the insensitive machine i mean i guess machines are inherently insensitive but maybe there's something nice about calling that out as it relates to the, the world that we're living in, especially an experience like right now where so much of our uh, uh, interaction with other human beings, you know, just like right now is through a machine and recognizing, remembering, be cognizant of the fact that this machine in itself is entirely insensitive and it's really us that, that bring any sensitivity to any of these situations. I think that sensitivity in general is very valuable and attractive to me. And this is maybe just more related to the pursuit of, um, again, like being creative in any sort of professional sense. It's, uh, it's that kind of tension of the opposite as well. And I think when you're in school often, you're not really encouraged to think about your, your experience or your career outside of school necessarily. You know, you're, you're encouraged in, in many ways to, to be creative. Um, if, if you're, you know, challenging yourself, you're, you're going to find ways to be vulnerable and um, fail potentially or, or, or just kind of take chances. When you're trying to support yourself, when you're trying to have a career, it's quite, it becomes quite difficult. It becomes quite complicated to be vulnerable. And obviously there's great value in vulnerability and, and really business has nothing to do with vulnerability at all. Uh, they're, they're polar opposites. So again, I, I guess I just, I see power in these things that oppose each other and uh, colliding them and, and pulling from both sides. How can you bring vulnerability into a business situation, you know, um, without abandoning or, or giving up your, um, your position or, or your uh, sense of self or whatever it is and vice versa. How, how can you bring business into a more vulnerable situation? You know, there's, there's really no sense in just being vulnerable all the time. Um, and yeah, you, you, you have to be business minded as well. Uh, there's no way around it. Otherwise, I don't know, you can go live in the woods or something. Judged by numbers. I mean, this is pretty much just in relation to Instagram, um, but it could be anything really just the internet and social media and all this stuff. This idea that, that we're judged, uh, 
or our self-worth or kind of our relationship to the self is informed by, by numbers, by these things that are, again, entirely insensitive, uh, entirely systematic and, and uh, logical, and, and they really serve no real purpose in um, actually defining or understanding ourselves, but I increasingly we're we're beholden um, to them, we're, we're at their mercy. And yeah, in the presentation, you guys mentioned social media and my relationship, and I don't know, it, it's it's pretty complicated, I think, or pretty uh, fraught relationship. I feel very conflicted about it. I think these things obviously have, have a deal of power and potential. Um, just don't rely on social media too much to, uh, to understand like who you are, what you want to do, and certainly don't don't seek validation for your ideas through that platform. The more you do, the the more likely you are to get away from yourself. Social media is really just a mirror, and the longer you stay into the mirror, the more self conscious you become. The further you get from yourself. But as far as time goes. Um, it's kind of just that simple as far as I'm concerned. I guess this could relate to like the 10,000 hour rule, which is something I've always been attracted to. Um, this, uh, this day kind of idea that, you know, if you invest 10,000 hours in, in a particular practice, you can become a master and 10,000 hours can kind of break down to, to 10 years. Seems like a long time. It's also kind of really not that much in the grand scheme of your your life. Um, but really, you put the time into something, and um, you will earn respect for that. Your time will always get respect, but you can't really can't really escape that. So I don't know anything you're serious about. Yeah, just invest time into it, uh, even when it's not making sense, even when. Um, I don't know. It's just a constant. It's an easy thing to to kind of pursue continually when perhaps other things don't make sense. Just keep putting time. This is kind of the same thing, or as it related to me at least. If you're a specialist, you you put ten thousand hours into one thing, and you're really good at that one thing. As a generalist, maybe you split your 10,000 hours between five, 10 different things. That specialist is always going to have um, uh, a deeper relationship to their kind of one pursuit. Um, but generalist is going to have, you know, a, a wider understanding of maybe everything around those things. You know, those are good people to work with. It's, it's good to interact with those people on either side. But I guess to me, this is more important about recognizing like what you are. Are you a generalist or are you a specialist? I, personally, I think I'm more of a generalist, you know, and maybe that just helps me sleep at night because I'm not really that great at any one thing. I mean, somehow I've made a career out of handwriting and I mean, look at my handwriting, it's, it's awful. But I think when I realized that I, it, it wasn't very good, I just started making it worse. I started becoming attracted, like how bad could this be? Um, I'm not sure where I'm going with that, but keep it moving. This is more direction of, of, of this part is more um, as far as like creative habits and and elements of your practice that can help you just keep up, keep putting that time in, keep uh, just how you how you relate to it. Uh, for me, systems are are really essential, whether it's. Uh, you know, always having a notebook on me and uh, at this point for, you know, a number of years, I've used to do the exact same notebook and would like to use the same notebook for the rest of my life, you know, just keep replacing them. So I have, you know, a thousand of these identical notebooks. And when you create a system like that, kind of a perimeter, it can go wild within it. You know, to keep up on this notebook example, it's like, I used to like buy a new notebook and I'd be excited about it. And I'd work in it for a little bit. And then, you know, maybe I'd see another notebook and I'd be attracted to that. It was totally different. Uh, and I'd take that and then I'd want to start that. And I've abandoned the old notebook. 
that's a mess. I, I got sick of that. I hated having all these half finished notebooks. I created having a system of just using this identical notebook, just kind of took that out of, uh, um, it wasn't a problem anymore. And I just got to kind of concern myself with what I was writing down or thinking about, you know, whatever, that, that's, that's kind of irrelevant. It's just about what systems make sense to you, like creating your own systems, the systems that suit you, that suit your personality, that your character, um, I think that's what makes you strongest, makes your creativity uh, most powerful is, um, is, is allowing those systems to kind of flow through you naturally and being able to identify them and, and then owning them, you know, um, especially if you feel they're unique to you or, or really whatever, really whatever makes sense to you, to be honest. I had, a, I had someone once tell me, you know, when making paintings, they said, so I'd be really eager to just uh, so, uh, it's like, okay, great. Um, okay, I like this. Now, let me do another one. I don't want to repeat myself. Or let me do something totally different. I would constantly be trying to like reinvent myself, which I'm maybe preaching in, in some other ways. But but equally, you know, there's value to, to the repetition and there's a lot to be learned. Um, what this person explained is like, if you make one painting you like, or like do 10 more, do nine more, make those 10 paintings. And by the time you get to the 10th one, either, either that 10th one will be the best, uh, and you'll have learned something along the way, or that first one might still be the best. And you still learn something along, along that course, you know, that maybe you really, you know, that it was a fluke or, or that you didn't even really know what you're doing or, or got away from yourself, whatever it is, you're going to learn something. So often repeating yourself can help you to better understand um, your relationship to, to what it is that you're doing. Or, you know, this is personal to me and, and my interest in words and language. Um, but really, I guess it's about, about um, a system as well. You know, an alphabet is really a system that we all agree on and rely on. And agitating that system, um, disrupting it is, uh, well, it's exciting to me, but I think the principle more is having a perimeter, um, some sort of box to, to contain everything uh, that, that maybe you draw or that is generally agreed on. And then within that box, like how, how crazy can you go? How much can you fuck shit up or whatever? Just what can you do within those parameters? If you're in a field, if you have no boundary, it can be quite difficult to really, really say anything. You're just, I don't know, you're gonna run, you might wanna sprint for a second and run, you're gonna get tired and you haven't, you know, there, there's really no, uh, there's really nothing to stop you or to, to push off of or, so personally, I, I like I like parameters. I like boundaries in which I can then kind of go off within those uh, those restrictions. So that's something I look for. Alphabet is one of the best. And patterns, as it as it relates both to to well systems really, and you know seeking those patterns, but equally uh, acknowledging that the patterns are in nature. Um, that these are things that that exist in the world far outside of us and and uh i don't know that becomes kind of undeniable we see patterns all over nature from from the macro to the micro you know from from you know under a microscope to to what you can see with your eyes in front of you to to what you can see from you know miles away um I think that's interesting, and, and I think if we apply that to our own practice, our own lives, seeking those patterns is powerful. I guess this is concerning material. You know, paper is really just paper, it's a material. Um, and when we print on it, you know, it becomes money and it takes on a value of its own. So maybe that's, uh, I mean, obviously that's, that's pretty interesting and uh, relates to so much. How to use material that's maybe neutral, neutral and, and loaded. How do you kind of inject um, meaning or, or um, power or uh, a form of communication into it? 
how do you use material to to your benefit to to towards your interest towards whatever and and just the power of material and also maybe the beauty of material in its pure form i would maybe argue that paper is more beautiful than money i mean i think that's actually made a pretty easy argument um money's not that beautiful it's just uh what we've decided um it's worth and how it can assist us i guess still in the realm of um of your creative pursuits i think when i think of this and i'm thinking of of communication um your intention will really help you understanding your intention will really help you with so many other things you understand your intention um you trust it you have a relationship to it uh that's a huge help in making other more uh other smaller and not any less significant but just all types of under other decisions so i think this is maybe about having um a root goal like if you're making a movie you know if you understand this your general relationship to the story um you have a vision for how you want this thing to look uh for how you want it to feel really you know it's like something as powerful as overarching as that is going to help you make a lot of smaller decisions um i you know i i could imagine something like this i mean it could apply to anything but you know in my mind i i would apply this to something like architecture um you know understanding your your relationship to or your intention your desire with a certain structure of building um whatever it might be uh will will help you hugely in in making all types of other decisions as far as why you would use a certain material uh where it would be located um you know the scale the uh I mean just you know endless amount of decisions that that you can really just um terrorize yourself over if uh if you allow it. Um so focusing and really starting from a place of understanding your intention um which really as it relates to the bigger picture is just the communicating and I think at the end of the day that's really what creativity is about. Uh it's a form of of communicating it's a it's a it's a it's a language. and um you got to know what you want to say before you start speaking i mean <laughs> i say that and um here i am just making a bunch of shit up but um this is this is kind of uh more of you know ignore the mirror if you're if you're concerned with uh if you're competitive which i am and and i imagine a lot of people are your competition will begin to control you um and you'll make decisions based on your competitive your kind of competitive relationship towards other people which is only going to do you a disservice um so maybe the most important person you could be in competition with is yourself um but beyond that really try your best not to compete with anyone else um uh and if they're not competing with you they're, they're going to have a step ahead of you you know if you're competing with them um maybe sometimes competition is valuable um again just like uh like heroes like ignoring your is i mean sometimes it's important to have a hero uh, an idol um of an idea a person whatever to to have some sort of point of reference to run towards if you're in a race perhaps maybe it's important to to recognize that someone is ahead of you um and, and that can motivate you like you know pull some energy from some hidden resource inside of you but um you know so competition you know is valuable but in general it does have a lot of control over you and and if you're the competitor it, it really is going to control you you know first of all i would just say uh fuck Picasso um but he has a he has a famous quote about a uh, good artist copy and great artist steal i think we can agree on that i think i think this applies to it as far as your character and your spirit if you're going to be inspired by something else 
don't try and imitate it. Just, just take it, just, just take it and make it your own. Um, you know, own it. Don't go halfway. I think copying is really just a form of going halfway, uh, half the distance. And, uh, what does that really work? Um, yeah, just fucking take it. <laughs> I know, you know, you're always taught not to steal, but I don't know. Stealing is quite valuable sometimes. And I don't think it needs to be so negative. Um, when you're, when you're stealing, when you're not stealing something physical, I don't know, we could go quite deep into this, but I think there's all types of form of stealing of theft that, that don't actually harm anyone else. You know, that, that's really, again, just about your relationship with yourself and, and maybe how you view it. Um, you know, whether you copy or steal something by, from the outside could look the same to someone else, but your relationship and your um, uh, intention is really what's going to define that. I think that's, maybe that's interesting. Your intention and your intention as opposed to in, in, as in copying versus stealing. Saying no is very powerful uh, on, on either side of things. I've kind of made a career, uh, it, you know, let's put that in quotes, but, um, off of saying no, I've, I've said no to a lot more stuff than I've said yes to, you know, a lot of the time really just out of, out of fear, you know, when I look back on it in retrospect, but, um, you know, you can earn respect from saying no, um, denial, you know, it could be denial of self, um, and the power that comes along with that. But as far as saying no, maybe this is interesting. Um, yeah, say no to distraction. Um, weapons of mass distraction. I think that's very emblematic of, of this time, especially like right now, everyone's trapped in their house, quarantine. It's very easy to be distracted. Uh, whether you're distracted, you know, by um, YouTube or you're distracted by the news or you're distracted by your own anxiety, distractions really are always going to pull you away from the core or, or just, I don't know, being close to anything. So, you know, maybe this is about the violence of, of distraction, the, the potential damage, the destruction of distraction. Um, and yeah, you know, as it relates to my own experience, I'm very easily distracted. This is kind of, this relates to time, the value of your time. And um, I think the anecdote for me with this is, you know, I, I love the library. I live here in New York and the public library here is incredible. It's one of my favorite places in the world. Um, and really the library anywhere. Um, when I go into a library, and I'm surrounded by books, I, I can, sometimes I'm just overwhelmed and I have this feeling of quite literally wanting to read everything. I want to consume it all. I feel this overwhelming desire to not to own or possess all of it, just to, to, to ingest, to open myself to everything. You know, it's a, it's a powerful feeling, but ultimately you really will never read, read, read everything. Maybe that was possible, you know, uh, a couple hundred years ago. Um, but it's, it's definitely not possible today. So on the other side of that, it becomes, well, what do you read? You know, and what you choose to read will really define so much else. So again, just flipping this, if you can't read any, everything, what can you read? And, and being really specific, really intentional with what you choose to read and, and the value of that intention. Um, yeah, I believe pretty, pretty strongly in that. This also got brought up um, in the presentation, which I appreciate. And yeah, I think this is particularly uh, apt right now. It's pretty self-evident too. Um, or maybe it's not, but I don't know. Walking's probably, you know, work in its, its purest form. It's one foot in front of the other. Um, 
in which you move forward and uh, you know uh, you repeatedly put one foot in front of the other, eventually you get somewhere. Um, I don't know, that's a pretty simple form of working. So maybe to pull something like interesting from that, it's just, you know, maybe it's the 10,000 hour thing, maybe it's um, time earns respect or, or however it relates to this. Um, yeah, working's essential, but it doesn't always need to be difficult, it doesn't always need to be complicated. Just keep walking, just always walk. I don't know, I live in a city where you walk everywhere. If I spend a day walking, I didn't accomplish anything. Well, it's, you know, I, I walked all day. I, I accomplished the, the act of, 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 of travel, of, uh, of experience, of whatever. Beauty in private. Maybe that's just more um, about sensitivity and, and your, um, yeah, your relationship with yourself, the ability, the freedom of seeing um, of beauty in, in, in private when you're alone, in, in the time you spend alone, and, and the power of, of your thoughts and your relationship to yourself when there's really no other point of reference around. There's, there's no sense of judgment or validation or, um, I mean, this is a pretty good theme for my talk, obviously. Um, you know, uh, these, none of these are really rules. They're all kind of, uh, some of a guide or a direction, uh, just a sign really, but really any combination of these things or just total obliteration of everything is, is perfectly fine. My uncle actually, that's where this came from, this, uh, an uncle of mine said that he wanted this on his tombstone. And I thought that was amazing as an epitaph. There's one slide after, one, one image left after this, but um, I'm not really gonna talk about the last one. I, I, don't, I don't know if any of you guys know who David Hammonds is. He's, um, I would encourage anyone to, to look him up if you're interested or if you know a little bit about him to go deeper. He's really, really interesting. Um, enigmatic and uh, mysterious artist, um, American artist, uh, who's really made a career out of out of denying the art world in uh, in in many ways, uh, and really uh, understood his value. Anyways, th this guy is very mysterious. He really doesn't exist. By some freak uh, freak chance, I I met this guy once, and um, it was at this framing shop. Um, I was friends with the guy who, who was the framer, and he also happened to be friends with David. And um, I was there, and he mentioned, oh, David's coming by to pick up a frame. I thought, okay, let me hang around. And then David showed up with his, his partner, and um, my friend Richard, the guy who ran the framing shop, introduced me. He said, this is, this is Jim. He's an artist. I was self-conscious in this guy's presence, you know, this kind of, this relates to so much of what I was talking about. It's kind of why I wanted to, to finish it. Um, you know, he, this was a hero of mine, you know, so in his presence, I, I, I didn't feel, uh, I lacked uh, like a sense of, of validity as far as being introduced as an artist. I was incredibly self-conscious about that. So when I was introduced, you know, as an artist, I, I said something kind of self-deprecating and, and something quite insecure, uh, you know, along the lines of, oh, you know, there's too many artists or everyone's an artist kind of thing. And he looked at me and he said, there aren't enough artists. And it really blew my mind because he was saying this, the same thing as me, um, but he was saying it with intention. He was saying it from a place of empowerment. Whereas I was, I was coming from this place of, uh, of fear, really, <laughs> you know, and then, and then he, he goes, he starts to smell me, he goes, like sniffs at me and goes, uh, he goes, you don't smell like an artist, which is another good one, the smell of an artist. Um, I said, okay, uh, what do I smell like? And he said, it's like, you smell like you read too much. Which, you know, now he's just trying to sun me. He's trying to, I don't know, call me like a, uh, I don't know, a graduate student or something, for example, um, which was which was fine, and and he was maybe wrong there, and um, then he he my friend showed him the the piece he was coming to pick up, and it was a it was a garbage bag, 
like literally just a black garbage bag that was torn to shreds in this beautiful frame. And that was the piece. You know, the, the whole situation was quite, quite, uh, quite relaxed. Although oh, I'm going to work on my smell. And he said, he kind of was a bit nicer. He said, don't worry, it, you know, it comes in time. That experience really, really struck me. Just that choice, that choice of your intention, you know, the choice to, to own um, your decisions, you know. It's, it's from that point that I've, I, I, I began to cultivate a real confidence in myself. Of, like, if I want to be an artist, I have to be able to, to say that I'm an artist. I have to be able to present myself and communicate that to other people. And if I can't do that, like, yeah, what am I doing? What am I pursuing? Uh, so I think that um, that trust in yourself, in your spirit, in your in your intention, and and confidence is is really essential to any creative person. Uh, and and owning that, not as far as just a title of you know how you make your money, how you what you went to school for, what you have a degree in, you know. Those things don't make you that, that thing specifically. It's, you know, if you're an artist, you're an architect, whatever it is, it's like, it, it's as it relates to you as a person and your life, at least as I see it. So yeah, that was a really formative experience. And I'd say again, David Hammonds, um, if any of you guys are interested, I'd, I'd really encourage you to, to look this guy up. And uh, yeah, this is the last slide, kind of like the first one. I don't know, uh, I think sometimes, I've done enough explaining and uh, <laughs> it just starts to fall apart the more I explain. So I'm pretty thrilled to say that that was uh, the end of my uh, <laughs> lecture. And um, thank you for, uh, for your patience, for your ears.